Now we are reading again this evening in Colossians chapter 1, and we are at the passage beginning in verse 24, and we will read through to the end of the chapter in verse 29. Now, says Paul, I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in all its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. We have been moving rather slowly, you may think, through this great letter to the Colossians, And we have begun now to see, I think, something of the shape of Paul's teaching. And since it is something like four weeks since we were last together with Colossians, let me try briefly to rehearse some of the things that we have been learning together. We have noticed that one of the buzzwords in the letter to the Colossians is the word fullness or filled. And Paul keeps using that kind of language over and over again, right from the beginning of the letter to the end of the letter. And in many ways, fullness is his chief concern. It is very possible, perhaps quite likely, that the reason he uses this language of fullness, which he doesn't use very much in his other letters, is because the messages that he was receiving back from Colossae were messages about a new teaching that was on the rise that emphasized fullness, for which the buzzword was fullness. You are looking for fullness of life, just as a number of years ago people used to speak about living life with a capital L. You don't hear people saying that kind of thing in the dreary 1990s, but when I was a young Christian, people used to speak about living life with a capital L. And that was what they offered people in the preaching of the gospel. It was very frequently said, do you want to live life with a capital L? Then you need to come to Jesus Christ who gives life in all its fullness and abundance. And so we're fairly familiar with a style of teaching, with a style of oratory and rhetoric even, that tends to use particular phrases that become dominant in the teaching. Just as as you watch the advertisements on television, there will be little phrases that will be used to make things stick in your memory. Preachers, good and bad, are not above doing that kind of thing. And apparently what was happening in Colossae was that an appeal was being made to these Colossian Christians who it seems were beginning to find that the Christian life was more of a struggle than they had ever anticipated. And these false teachers were offering the possibility of a fullness that the gospel Paul preached and that Epaphras had brought to them that that gospel couldn't deliver. And Paul is at great pains in this letter to underline that the apostolic teaching, the apostolic gospel is in fact characterized by the only fullness that's worth having. And already in this opening chapter and into the beginning of chapter 2, he gives us some basic clues as to how that is. He himself, in our passage this evening in verse 25, tells us that his ministry was to present the Word of God in all its fullness. That is, he labored in order to present the whole truth of the gospel, what he had called when he spoke to the Ephesian elders, 
the whole counsel of God to them in order that they might have all the truth, the fullness of truth that God wanted to teach them. And at the very center of that is what he mentions here earlier on in chapter 1, verse 19. At the center of the fullness of the Word of God is a message about the fullness of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 19, God was pleased, he says, to have all his fullness dwell in him. And he returns to that same idea in chapter 2, verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the Godhead lives in bodily form. So he teaches them all the counsel of God in order that they may know all the fullness of Christ, in order that they may discover that they themselves have already come to fullness of life in Christ. Notice how he goes on in chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ. And his basic message is this. You do not need to add to the fullness of Christ to come to fullness of life. What you need to do is to draw on the resources of the fullness that there is in Christ in order that you may be so filled with Christ as yourself to come to a glorious fullness of life. And he is working this through in a variety of different ways. He has begun with thanksgiving and prayer. He has moved on in chapter 1, verse 15 to verse 23, to set before us one of the most glorious portrayals of the cosmic greatness of Jesus Christ anywhere to be found in the New Testament. And now he is going on on the basis of that, partly in order to defend Epaphras' teaching. He is going on on the basis of that to show them the implications of this in his own ministry. He is speaking in this section about the cosmic nature of his own ministry. He is concerned for the whole church. He will go on in what follows to emphasize his particular concern for the Colossians. And then he will go on in a general way in chapter 3, verse 1 following, to expound to them the basic principles of living a full Christian life out of the fullness of the resources that there are in Jesus Christ. And he does this in chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, before he turns in chapter 3, verse 18 to chapter 4, verse 1, to describe how this works out in the basic contexts in which we are to live the Christian life. And then he moves on to teach us what it means to be engaged in bringing this gospel of the fullness of Christ to a world that has not yet known it. And then he ends the letter by sharing a number of news items about other Christian believers who have come to fullness of life in Jesus Christ and are living out the Christian life. Now we have come to this third section in the letter from chapter 1, verse 24, to the end of verse 29. And we noted last time that in this section where Paul is, as it were, embracing the whole church of Jesus Christ and feeling the weight of his responsibility for it. And he is saying to us three things about his ministry. First of all, he has described the suffering in which he rejoices. In verse 24, he is prepared to suffer for the sake of the, of the church, and that suffering is an expression of the intimacy of his fellowship with Jesus Christ. And we spent the whole time last time we were studying Colossians on that very important verse. His suffering for Christ's sake and for the church's sake in which he rejoices. And we noted then that there are two further things that Paul goes on to discuss which we will examine in a little more detail this evening. The first of those things in verse 25 to verse 27 is the commission 
with which he has been entrusted. I have become its servant by the commission, verse 25, by the commission God gave me. And the second is the goal to which he is committed in his ministry. The commission with which he has been entrusted in his ministry in verses 25 to 27, and the goal to which he is committed in his ministry in verses 28 and 29. Our goal is we proclaim Christ in order that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Now let's try and look at these two foci which Paul has here. The commission with which he has been entrusted, the goal to which he himself is committed. In verses 25 to 27, he is speaking about the commission with which he was entrusted. And I think it becomes evident to us that the magnitude of the trials which the Apostle Paul experienced, the magnitude of the trials he experienced, appear to have been related to the magnitude of the commission which he had been given. He gives us a number of hints, and we have seen them at different times in his letters, that he is conscious that the apostolic Christian life is the Christian life lived on the large scale. He speaks about the Lord putting the apostles on display as though he were wanting to say the principles which God works out in every Christian believer's life, he has worked out in the apostles who, as it were, are the kind of pioneers of living the Christian life. He's worked it out on such a grand scale that it's possible for us in our miniature living out of these principles to see what these principles are and to apply them to ourselves. Now, that's a different kind of architecture from the kind of architecture you and I are accustomed to. If we wanted to build something, say we wanted to build a new church, I suppose one of the first things the architect would do, we would gather together as a congregation, and he would bring along a little working model. And he would tell us this is in the scale of one to 500 or whatever. So our modern architects, like ancient architects, we make small working models in order that we may see what the great thing will be. But in his kindness and providence, the Lord operates quite the reverse. He makes huge working models in order that we can see clearly the principles on which he is building the church and the principles on which he's building the Christian life so that we who ordinarily do not suffer as much as the apostles, do not experience all the things the apostles experience, so that we can see these principles at work in their lives and then say, and now I see how these things are happening in my life. Now that I've seen it, as it were, in glorious technicolor, I can watch it on my own handheld TV, and I can understand the ways the Lord is working in my life. And Paul is very conscious of this. He is conscious that part of the fruitfulness of his ministry is because he has been a powerfully plowed up field. He has suffered so much and will suffer so much. It was one of the first things he was taught. You must tell him how great things he must suffer for my sake. And as we saw at the end last time, he had learned it from Stephen. Why did Stephen suffer so much and so apparently uselessly? Because God had a phenomenal plan to bring to fruition out of Stephen's suffering. And that was the ministry of the converted Saul of Tarsus. Now we see the magnitude of Paul's ministry, which, as I say, is commensurate with the magnitude of his sufferings in a number of different ways here. He speaks, first of all, about the breadth of it. 
He says, I have become the servant of the church by the commission of God in order to present to you the word of God in all its fullness. You know, some of you speak and preach and teach, and you will share the same experience I do, although it's not always evident to the people who listen to us. You almost invariably go away from expounding a passage of Scripture with that slightly uneasy feeling that you're still simply scratching the surface. Now, here is the Apostle Paul, and he is overwhelmed with this burden of presenting all of God's truth to all of God's people. I rather suspect that the Colossians had at least heard how he did that because they were so near Ephesus and the message of the gospel had been brought to them by Epaphras who had probably been converted under Paul's ministry in Ephesus. You remember what Paul did in Ephesus? He hired the lecture hall of Tyrannus who was probably a teacher of philosophy. And in that uh, climate, uh, hot in the middle of the day, Tyrannus did what every self-respecting philosopher would have done. He went to bed to think his great thoughts, got a cool drink and lay down. But he was not only a philosopher, he had a shrewd sense of the financial value of his property. And so he rented it out to the Apostle Paul during the siesta hours. The only people mad enough to be doing any kind of study in the heat of the day during the siesta hours, apparently in Ephesus, were these new Christian believers. And during that period, which lasted right through the middle of the day for several hours, Paul was daily teaching these young Christians in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. If you work that out, I did once work that out in my youth when my arithmetic was still capable of it. It works out at something in the region of hearing three 40-minute sermons a week for somewhere in the region between 40 and 50 years, and Paul did it in three. Now, why did he do this? Because he recognized that if the Word of God, the message of the gospel, was the chief instrument that would build up these Christians then he was prepared to throw himself and apparently prepared to throw them into the most arduous course of study, instruction, discussion, understanding. How do we apply this? How does this work out? In order that all of God's truth might be brought to bear upon their lives so that it could be exhibited in flesh and blood in these Ephesian Christians. And you remember when he calls the Ephesian elders at Miletus in Acts chapter 20, he says, imagine being able to say this. It just staggers me. He says, I withheld nothing from you that was for your profit, and I taught you all of God's counsel. Now, that was the breadth of his ministry, the fullness of God's word that he wanted to bring to bear upon them. But he also speaks, that's, that would be enough for us, it's not enough for Paul. He also speaks about the depth of this commission which he's been given. And notice the language he uses. He presented to them the word of God in all its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. He's not only got a sense of the breadth of what he's teaching them, but he has an enthusiastic, excited sense of the depth of what he's teaching them. He is showing them a mystery. Now, a mystery, as you know, in the language of the New Testament, is not something so much mystical and mysterious as something that is hidden or unknown until it's revealed something that's true, but by and large unknown until someone steps forward and takes away the curtain and says, now look at that. And Paul was very conscious that there were things in the gospel that were such a mystery, and he mentions one of them here. 
He says, to them God has chosen to make known, verse 27, among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Part of this mystery that has been hidden for ages is this, that the gospel, the salvation of God, is not for the Jew alone, but also for the Gentile. Now, there were hints of that in the Old Testament, many hints of that in the Old Testament, right from the covenant made with Abraham. In you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. That was a hint given in Genesis chapter 12 that God's intention was not merely that the good news would be brought to the Jews, but the good news of his grace and his Messiah was intended for all nations. The gospel coming to the Gentiles is not plan B. Some of you may have been taught that in the past. If you've been taught that in the past, you may disabuse your mind of that. It's not true. The gospel coming to the Gentiles is not plan B. It's part of plan A. It's there in Genesis chapter 12. In you, in your seed, that is the coming Messiah. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. But of course, in the days of the Old Testament, it was hidden. The eyes of the people were blinded. They couldn't see it. They huddled the good news to themselves. And only occasionally did somebody like Rahab the harlot or Ruth the Moabitess be drawn into the salvation of God in the Old Testament. And Paul is running around the ancient world, a man transformed from being a prejudiced, little, bow-legged, bigoted Jew. And he is so excited about this, that God's given salvation to the Gentiles. Indeed, in the twin letter to the Ephesians, he virtually loses the place in the middle of Ephesians because he's so excited about it. If you look at what he says at the beginning of chapter 3, In Ephesians, he says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. And if you then look at the beginning of chapter 4, you'll notice that he was probably going on to say what he says in chapter 4. But he's so excited about what he's just said at the beginning of chapter 3 that he spins out another chapter explaining how amazing this is to him, that he's a prisoner of Christ Jesus For the sake of the Gentiles, it was unthinkable for a Jew to care a rap about the Gentiles, to be a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles, was totally unheard of. What's made the difference in this man's life? Well, it's simply this. The curtain's been torn back, as it was on the Damascus Road, and he's seen the kind of Savior Jesus Christ is. And he is for all, not just for the Jew. He is also for the Gentile. And so Paul, who speaks about the breadth of his commission, reaches down and brings out the depth of his commission. But he also, you notice as he comes to the very heart of this mystery, speaks about the height of his commission. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. See him piling up the language, saying, now get a flavor of this. We are not just talking mystery here. We are talking riches. And we are not just talking riches here. We are talking glorious riches. He's saying, let me get to the very heart of this gospel with which I've been entrusted. What is our privilege? It is that Christ in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. Christ comes to dwell in you as the hope of glory. I can only say, my dear friends, think about it. Think about it till your head hurts thinking about it. But think about it until your heart has begun to take it in. This is the privilege that's given to you 
as a Christian believer that the Lord of glory in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily by his Holy Spirit comes to indwell the Christian believer. Do you remember how Jesus spoke about that in the second half of John chapter 14 when he promised the disciples that they would receive the Holy Spirit and he spoke about the way in which through the gift of the Holy Spirit from the day of Pentecost, he himself would come with his Father and make his home in the disciples. He says, not only if anyone loves me will he obey my teaching, but my Father will love him, and we, I and my Father, will come to him and make our home with him. And this is what thrills Paul. Not only that he's discovered that Jesus is the true Messiah. And because Jesus is the true Messiah, that means that God has become his father. But he's discovered also that through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the Lord of glory comes to dwell in his life. He never explains this in any detail. He says, for example, in Romans chapter 8, round about verse 9, that this is something that takes place through the indwelling ministry of the Spirit. But this is such a huge mystery, such an amazing reality, that he doesn't have language to express the sheer wonder of this. That he, Paul, that you and I should be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. I don't know if I've ever told you before, I probably haven't, but uh, I remember in my early Christian years as a teenager, uh, in some instances, the very sermons out of which I learned truths that I've lived on these several decades since. And I will never forget as a boy, I must have been 15, maybe 16, I don't think I was... 16, I think it was probably 15. Uh, sitting listening to Peter Bissett in Rutherford Church in Deniston preach from this text, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And as a one year old Christian, I remember lingering in the church afterwards until everyone was away and looking up and down the street and then up and down the street again to make sure nobody was watching me and running home so excited that this could be true of me, a young Christian, that the Lord Jesus Christ in all his grace and glory was actually prepared to come and in this mysterious way by the ministry of his Spirit dwell in me. Now you see, that, says the apostle, is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. What is hope? We've seen him refer to hope twice already in this passage. Hope is not something for the never-never future. Hope is a reality which we haven't yet fully experienced. But you see, he's hinting to us here that the believer in part experiences glory. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you, he says, is like already having a little taste of glory here and now. Some of our hymns give expression to that. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. And these are the privileges, he says, that he has been entrusted with in his proclamation of the gospel. As he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, he says, The gospel gives us a great hope, but unlike other hopes, this hope is not one by which we will be disappointed. Why? Remember how he answers? Because, he says, the love of God has already been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. How is it that our hope of heaven and glory will not be disappointed? What guarantees we won't be disappointed is that the pouring of the love of heaven into our hearts 
starts even before we are in heaven. The intimacy of communion with Jesus Christ starts before we see his face. As Isaac Walton, I'm sure I've recited these verses to you before, as Isaac Walton, the author of The Complete Angler in the 17th century, said once about Richard Sibbs, a great Puritan preacher, of that blessed man, let this just praise be given, that heaven was in him before he was in heaven. And that's not just poetry. It's not actually very great poetry, but it is poetry. That's not just poetry. It's not just true of Richard Sibbs, who was truly a great man. Paul is saying it's true of every believer. It's true of these believers he has never met in Colossae. If you're a believer, he is saying, then Christ dwells in you. And that itself is the hope of glory. Well, what about the goal to which he is committed? I am uh, covenanted utterly to getting through to the end of this chapter this evening. Uh, What about this goal to which he is committed? Well, he mentions it, you'll notice, in verses 28 and 29. And it has three basic elements to it. First of all, he wants to proclaim Christ. Second, he wants to present Christ every believer perfect or mature. And third, he is prepared literally to work to the point of exhaustion in order to fulfill that goal. Look first of all at what he says about the proclamation of Christ. He says this in verse 28, we proclaim him. And the language he uses is the language of the herald who declares the message of the master. But it's interesting to notice what he adds to that that characterizes apparently Paul's preaching and teaching. We proclaim Christ. Notice how the center of his message is Christ. We proclaim Christ, admonishing, teaching, and distributing wisdom. That, for those of us who our preachers and teachers at whatever level provide us with a kind of grid of what ought to be true of our preaching and teaching. It ought to be a proclamation and an explanation of the facts of the message of the gospel, the facts of the message of the passage of Scripture we are studying, but it also ought to be characterized by admonition, by instruction, and by the impartation of wisdom. The language that Paul uses here for admonition, preaching, proclaiming him with admonition, is language that might be used, for example, in family life in the ancient world, of trying to get your child to understand what you're talking about, to bring your children up in a certain way. It's practical. Paul is saying, I'm not just content with the proclamation of the gospel. What I want to do is, as it were, to come down into people's lives, to get right into people's heads and say, now this is what it means to you. This is how it works for you. He admonishes them. He doesn't just, as many counselors in the modern world do, he doesn't just act as a sounding board for other people's thoughts when he is expounding the Scriptures. No, he goes beyond that and he says, no, it's very important for you to see how this is going to work out in your life. And so his preaching, his proclamation is characterized by admonition. But it's also characterized, you'll notice, by instruction. He is always teaching. He is always teaching. And he's always going over the teaching. It's fairly characteristic of Paul's teaching, as they often say, uh, is characteristic of a good teacher, that it's so important to go over things again and again until people have really grasped 
what they need to learn, what they need to know. That's why Paul says to Timothy, you need to teach with great patience. And then he adds this, that this teaching, this proclamation, will be characterized by wisdom, by savvy, by a kind of mixture of spiritual understanding and spiritual sensitivity that enables those who hear Paul's teaching to so instinctively have it worked into their lives that in different situations, without having to run back to their closet to get their Bible out and say, now, how do I need to look up? What am I supposed to read when I'm anxious or troubled or weary or perplexed? No, he wants to teach them in such a way that all that is in here, that you're not rushing away to the Bible as though it were a kind of A to Z map of the Christian life, looking up the index and then finding the the right place on the grid. It's A5 on page 61. And there's bound to be somebody here who lives in A5 on page 61. No, he's he's wanting to get the Bible into them, almost to the point. And this was true of our Lord Jesus. I have no doubt this was true of our Lord Jesus. You remember, he did not possess a Bible. But I am pretty certain there wasn't one jot or tittle of the Bible that he didn't possess in his memory, in his instinct. He seems to have had a remarkable capability just to, as it were, reach out for Scripture text. It was all part of him. And it's that, it's the weaving of the teaching of Scripture into the very fiber of the being of his hearers that Paul is so burdened about. And it's the goal to which he is committed as a teacher of the gospel. And the goal to which we who teach the gospel must be committed. And all of us who, if I can put it this way, are seeking to teach ourselves the gospel in our personal Bible study, seek to be committed. So he wants to proclaim Christ in his fullness. He wants to present everyone perfect in Christ before the throne of God. That is, he wants to see specific fruit from his teaching in their growing to perfection. Now, he may have in mind here ultimate perfection, or he may have in mind what is sometimes uh, probably more characteristically true of the New Testament language, what we would call maturity, completeness, wholeness. Now, there's something for those of us who are Sunday school teachers or who are teachers of our children or who in one sense or another are teachers and preachers of the gospel in Bible class or among the young people or outside of the church and some of the organizations we're involved in. What's our great goal? Our great goal always must be to see those we teach brought to maturity, to see these little ones who sit here wide-eyed. What a privilege it is to speak to them on Sunday. More and more of a privilege. As I suspect, more and more parents are wanting to serve the Lord in bringing their own children up, 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 up to maturity. Well, this is the apostolic goal written large in him and by God's grace imitated by us. So his goal is to proclaim Christ, to present everyone mature in Christ. And then personally, in order that these two things may be true, his personal goal is to labor in the service of the gospel. Verse 29, this is one of the great Pauline personal statements. To this end, I labor. Now, just look at the, just look at the language he uses in this verse. Labor, struggle, energy, powerful, work. You catch the sense of what he thinks the service of the gospel is. It is literally labor to the point of exhaustion. It is struggle. It demands energy. 
And thankfully he recognizes that that energy cannot come from within, but must come from the power of God that works within him. Now, I have no doubt this is the apostolic scale. But even if you and I are not called to live the Christian life on the apostolic scale of a man who goes, as it were, from the far east to the far far west of the Mediterranean basin, if we are simply called to live it in some small part of Glasgow, then in miniature at least this will also be true of us. It's certainly, I know, not politically correct to do this kind of thing. I rather suspect it's no longer seen as Christianly correct to live this kind of way. You're not supposed to labor to the point of exhaustion. It's not good for you. It's not good for you physically. It's not good for you mentally. It's not good for you psychologically. Oh, Paul is conscious of all that, as Jesus was conscious of it. Remember how often Jesus seemed to say, this body can't take anymore, I need to get away. Up the hills, beside the lake, I need to get away. But you notice why he needed to get away. He needed to get away because he was so willing to be stretched so far. And that was true also of the Apostle Paul. We sometimes forget he must have had many hours of relative leisure on the calm crossings of the Mediterranean. Many hours of relative leisure as he walked through the highways of the ancient Roman world. But there were many other times when he was at a stretch, when he was laboring to the point of exhaustion. He knew how to look after what Martin Luther called brother ass. But the reason he looked after it was in order that it might be a useful instrument when the situation required that he would labor to the point of exhaustion. That's a tremendous challenge for us, I think, today. I was almost going to say some of you are old enough, but if you're as old as I am, you're old enough to remember, wasn't it Sir Arnold Lund's book, The Cult of Softness? And it's spread all over. I suspect some of our older members looking at us and remembering the labors of their earlier days, some of you who were involved in the tent hall, perhaps in earlier days, and the hours and the zeal of prayer and service. You must look at we younger ones, we children, and think, what flabbiness has taken hold of our spiritual children? Well, let's pray that something of this apostolic working model may be reproduced at least in miniature in our lives and in our fellowship. Heavenly Father, we can't but think of those who have gone before us who thus labored, those of whom we've read in Scripture and those whom we've been privileged to know. And we pray to you tonight for wisdom. Some of us are inclined to take things easy in self-defense and some of us inclined to be rather reckless and careless with our energies. But we do pray that there will be none of us unwilling to labor and toil in order that Christ may be fully displayed in the lives of those we serve. And we ask for your help for this energy, this power of which we've read tonight, that we do not have in ourselves, but we have experienced before that you have given to us. And we pray that we may see this marvelous combination of our willingness to become weak in order that we may be vessels in which you become strong. And we ask for
as so many of us here tonight are involved in a teaching ministry of one kind or another, that you would call us to share in this great vision and that those in our charge, think of our Sunday school teachers here and these little lives, how we long that our teachers may have the grace and the patience and the endurance to bring them on a little further in maturity. And those of us who work among younger ones in the church here and in various organizations, crusaders and navigators and intervarsity and other organizations, those of us who seek to bring on those who are older and yet are younger Christians. Lord, what a vision. Help us, we pray. And so, come to us by your word this evening, that the knowledge that Christ, the hope of glory, indwells us, will both sustain and thrill us. And this we pray together in Jesus' name. Amen.